Hello and good evening. I'm Marlene Speth and on behalf of the organizing committee um, of, and the ERS, I'm very happy to welcome you to the ERS webinar series for the great team of panelists. We would like to thank Olympus as a main sponsor. So this evening we will be talking about outpatient rhinology procedures. It is a real pleasure this evening to welcome three colleagues, all with expensive, ex extensive experience. We have Sean Carey from Newcastle, we have Jaime Vieira Artiles from Spain and Jonathan Joseph from London. Um, for those who are new to the webinar series, um, please type your questions into the chat. So now, without further ado, I would like to pass over to Sean Carey. He's a consultant at um, Newcastle and he will start with a presentation. He will talk about the background rationale for local anesthetic nasal surgery and how to develop your practice and the outcomes. Marlena, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure to uh, join you this evening and thank you very much for the invitation. It's very nice to be on this side of the, uh, the screen for a change. And um, I'm going to kick off by talking about uh, my experience of office-based rhinology. Um, just to uh, put a caveat in that um, we had to um, slow down quite considerably during a, a, the uh, pandemic and we've struggled a little bit to get going again afterwards. So most of my experience is, uh, is pre-pandemic with this, um, but we are starting off again uh, in, uh, in Newcastle. So these are my disclosures. Uh, and I suppose what under, what underpins this? Well, worldwide, undoubtedly, what's happening in, in healthcare. I can't see your screen. Can everyone else see the screen? No. Sean, if you can just uh, share your screen and then it's going to be absolutely perfect. You share? I can see. I think though, if you unshare it, Pavel, you have to sort of flick between the two. Perfect. Thank you very much. Have you got it there? Yes. Yeah. OK, let me just get out there. Still there? Yes. Yes, good. OK, That's sorry correct. about that. Yeah, so um, what kind of underpins the move towards uh, considering local anaesthetic surgery? Well, around the world, healthcare is becoming increasingly more expensive. We're spending more of our gross domestic product uh, on uh, healthcare and commissioners are beginning to note that there's quite a considerable variation in procedures performed and cost of procedures, both within individual countries and between countries. Um, and to address that, um, they're looking increasingly at the value they uh, achieve from purchasing healthcare. And I suppose it's easy enough to, to sort of calculate value crudely. Um, that is as such that it's um, the outcome that matters to patients over the cost per patient. And we don't, certainly don't want to reduce the quality of experience for the patient. Um, so what, in, in order to improve value, what we really want to look is to reducing the cost per patient. And I think that's really where local anaesthetic uh, comes in and for me became a very important part of uh, moving towards this sort of uh, surgery in selected cases. In terms of the sort of history of uh, office-based surgery, you can call it ambulatory, you can call it day case, it really started out in the States. But actually when we join together in meetings and uh, sort of social events, you do understand that actually there are quite a few people around the globe who are beginning to think about this. Um, but there's not a huge uptake. And I think a lot of that is because there's a lack of good quality evidence underpinning local anesthetic surgery. And, and people don't really have guidelines on how to start and what sort of um, procedures they should uh, be thinking about doing. When you look at the literature, it's really quite interesting. Um, there's not a lot of literature on local anaesthetic surgery, but this is quite an interesting study published in 2019 from the uh, US. And this looks at uh, Medicare utilization and billing data. So essentially that's the reimbursement that uh, clinicians in the US can experience from various procedures. Um, and this looks at, in orange, uh, balloon sinoplasty, and in blue, endoscopic sinus surgery. And you can see between 2012 and 2016 on that graph on the right hand side, how the reimbursement for balloon sinoplasty has just taken off uh, across those um, five years. Uh, whereas the reimbursement for traditional surgeries 
really hasn't changed uh, uh, drastically um, at all. And I think to a large extent, this balloon sinoplasty that's really pushed day case or local anesthetic surgery forward. And on the tail of that, hanging on to the coattails, really, other procedures have come in place. And indeed, if you look at the same data, 34-fold 34 fold increase in ethmoidectomy, whatever an ethmoidectomy is classed as, and a five-fold increase in septoplasty was noted in this data. And when the American Rhinologic Society surveyed uh, their membership on uh, local anaesthetic um, procedures and how many were undertaking this sort of thing. They did so in 2019, published it then. Um, and they had an 11% response rate to their survey. And at that stage, about 77% of the respondents were undertaking polypectomy in, sur in, uh, in office and just over half balloon sinoplasty. But again, it was quite interesting that in-office ethmoidectomy and in-office frontal sinusotomy were procedures that were beginning to be explored and undertaken. And on the graph on the right-hand side, you can see this was not necessarily um, restricted to certain parts of the US. It was really pretty global across the US. Um, and it was also um, global um, across uh, different types of surgeons. So, from academic through single specialty to um, solo practice. Other interesting data to come out of uh, sort of balloon and implant in, in local anaesthetic procedures were actually, despite the fact that we hear in the US that lots of people are undertaking this sort of surgery, you can see um, that looking at average uh, numbers of sinoplasty on the left and average numbers of office implants on the right per month, uh, the numbers are really quite small, uh, with you know, almost 90% performing somewhere between less, well, somewhere less than five uh, sinoplasties per month, and very similar numbers of uh, implants. And so, when you look at the global literature, so if we look beyond America, what sort of cases are are being taken under uh, under local anesthesia? Well, there are very few good quality um, studies out there. And in fact, most of the studies we're seeing are case series. Um, and on the left there, you can see the types of procedures that are performed uh, and, uh, uh, and of which there are some studies within the literature. I'm not going to measure mention any more about nasal fracture manipulation because that really is, uh, is almost universal. But there are many studies looking at nasal polypectomy and endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, many on balloon sinoplasty. Uh, there are one or two studies looking at inferior turbinate surgery, but it's less so looking at outcomes under local anesthesia and really more looking at the various techniques. Um, and certainly any randomized controlled trials have really been looking at techniques of inferior turbinate surgery. But there are also uh, uh, studies looking at septoplasty and septorhinoplasty, um, although those are very small. Uh, in uh, in number. And it was on the background of this that the uh, British Rhinologic Society uh, did a, a comprehensive uh, assessment of the literature and produced a, a local anaesthetic um, guideline for clinicians who might be interested in developing a, a rhinologic um, uh, surgery service under local anaesthesia. And if you're interested, you might want to have a look at the ENT UK website um, to uh, to assess that further. But there are a number of uh, guidelines that are coming out now um, uh, around uh, the patch, so not just in the uh, in the UK. When we look at the patient uh, experience or the patient preference for uh, local anaesthetic surgery, there really is not very much in the in the literature. This is a bit of a busy slide. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a a, a meta-analysis really looking at um, uh, studies in the literature, and this was um, written up by uh, Afik Slim, who's one of uh, the uh, British Rhinologic Society juniors. And whilst it's a busy slide, uh, we can see there beside the first red star the number of nasal bone manipulation studies. There are about four of them in the literature, and you can see that patient preference, which would be classified as a patient who uh, would be happy to undergo the procedure again under local anaesthetic. You can see actually the rates were really pretty poor with about a 60 to 80% uh, preference for it. 
But when you move down to DCR, in which there are four studies, nasal polypectomy, two studies, and turbinate reduction, where there are two studies, you can see that patient preference for local anesthetic is really quite high and above 80%. If we look at patient satisfaction, so in terms of outcome, and this was very um, uh, heterogeneous, uh, again, there's not a great deal of data looking at studies. There are about 27 papers looking at patient satisfaction across a number of different procedures. And again, I apologize for a rather busy slide, but if we look at this group here of three studies uh, looking at turbinate reduction, we can see high satisfaction rates. The same with DCR under local anesthesia with over 90% satisfaction rates. Uh, manipulation of nasal bone, really quite low satisfaction rates, around about 50% under local anesthesia. Uh, and septoplasty, which may be combined with sedation, uh, again, reasonably high satisfaction rates. And this one, the final one, sphenopalatine artery ligation. There are three studies looking at that, again, with reasonably high satisfaction rates. If we look at nasal polypectomy, which was the area that initially intrigued me about uh, local anaesthetic surgery, we published some data in clinical otolaryngology, uh, and we found, you know, looking at a sort of reduction in SNOT22 score um, of uh, about 15 uh, points at two weeks. Uh, when we assessed it at three months, we were getting reductions of around about 20 points. Uh, Casali, uh, uh, sorry, at a year, we found a similar reduction. Uh, of around about 20 points, but Casali, who was the only other um, uh, uh, individual who published on this, he found similar sort of uh, rates uh, at seven months of around about a reduction in uh, SNOT 22, of around about 25 to um, 30. So there's obviously clear evidence of patient reported uh, outcome improvement with local anaesthetic polyp surgery. And it doesn't really matter what procedure you look at, uh, across the local anaesthetic options, and these are numbers of cases of individual procedures. You can see that the uh, complication rates <laughs> really are um, quite low. So in terms of the literature, there certainly is some evidence of potential benefit, but what really drove this uh, for most of us? Well, a lot of us have patients who request procedures under local anaesthesia, <laughs> and for Many of us, again, particularly post-COVID, there are significant waiting lists for surgery and other ways we can move patients out of the operating theatre uh, or the inpatient operating theatre into a day case list or a clinic uh, setting or some form of ambulatory uh, 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 setting. And I think with increasing surgical experience, uh, with the advent of new technologies, uh, with improvements in visualisation and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, debriders, we've got a real opportunity to uh, move into uh, doing things uh, differently under local anaesthesia. And really, I'm not talking about doing something like this under local anaesthetic, but something like this. This is a patient with uh, central compartment um, allergic type uh, nasal polyposis. This is an ideal case to consider starting under local anaesthesia. And if you are going to start a service, you need to consider exactly what your service is going to, um, to look like. For me, it, I was really keen to have a, 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 a patient experience that was a little bit like going to the dentist. Um, so that the patient would come into a clinic room, fully dressed, would have a procedure that lasts around about half an hour to 40 minutes. Um, and then the patient would, uh, would be discharged uh, within an hour or two. So a rapid increase in the standard patient journey. And in order to do something like that, you really need to have the support of your colleagues, uh, from uh, the support of managers um, and uh, individuals within your, uh, your organization. Uh, and once you do have that, you can set up a team and you'll find that a team is a really good way if you develop a, 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 a team with, uh, with colleagues, with nursing colleagues, it develops a life of its own and everybody starts to, um, to build um, on uh, what is a, a relatively limited uh, experience at the outset. And you can consider what procedures you're going to do uh, from simple div division of adhesions through polypectomy and sinus surgery, turbinate reduction uh, down to um, tumor biopsies. The ideal patient, 
um, is perhaps a patient who will tolerate endoscopy. So if you uh, are in clinic with a patient and you pop the telescope into the nose, particularly without any anesthesia, and they don't recoil from you, then this is a sort of patient who's likely to um, benefit from uh, a consideration of uh, local anesthetic surgery. You want to avoid any contraindications. And I think the sort of sort of things that you want to avoid when you're starting out are patients with very edematous mucosa or a very twisted nasal septum, or perhaps you have some bleeding risk. Our workup would include a CT scan under local anesthesia uh, cases, and we consent patients to both local and general. So give them a, a, an opportunity to decide which way they want to go. And we have patient specific leaflets for both local and general um, anesthesia. That is the sort of patient you don't really want to start out with. First of all, that's an ASA uh, asthma associated nasal polyposis, very edematous mucosa, previous operations, and that would be a real challenge with significant uh, uh, potential for bleeding. I'm going to end my uh, presentation with this slide, given the, uh, the, uh, the time constraints, but this is how we uh, run our um, uh, clinic in uh, Newcastle. Uh, we have a pre-procedure room in our outpatient clinic uh, where patients uh, have their uh, local anaesthetic inserted. Uh, after 20 minutes or so, they move through to the operating room where they have a procedure that will take around about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, they then recover in a, uh, 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 an adjacent area very close to the operating room. Uh, and our expectation is that they would be discharged within an hour or two of um, their uh, their procedure, and and finally, just to sort of show you the the, uh, the setup, this is our uh, clinic room. Um, things have changed now uh, following COVID, so we uh, are always wearing face masks. Um, and the deliberate mistake here, you can see, is although the patient is under local anaesthesia, um, one of us should be looking directly at the patient, uh, and you can see that both of us are looking at the screen there. So that would be the one thing that I would. Uh, counsel you against, make sure that you keep the conversation and a close eye on the uh, the patient. So Marlena, I'll stop there in the uh, interest of time. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present and uh, I shall hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Sean. This was a really nice introduction. So now the next panelist is uh, Jaime Vieira Artiles. He's working in Santander in Spain. And he will now talk about awake rhinology surgery potentials and limitations. Thank you, Marlene. And thanks to the European Rhinology Society for having me here. It's a pleasure to share some, some of my um, experience in, in this field. Um, I My talk is about potentials and limitations, but I think limitations are way more interesting. Um, Dr. Kari has already say, uh, mentioned some of them, but I, I try to sum up um, what I have found, uh, which which has been the limitation that I have I faced uh, faced in in the past, and also what other colleague has has been telling me when we share uh, our experiences. So, uh, in order to have a, a successful awake uh, renal procedure, we have to choose uh, wisely the patient, and we have to have a, the, uh, a good, nicely trained staff, and pick the the right location with all the safety measures that I will talk about. We have to take a look about the regulation of the in the country that we're working and has going to be the reimbursement or the remuneration, which depends if you're working, working in private or in public system. Um, a little bit of the limitations that we might find um, in the surgery. So let's, let's uh, start uh, about the patient. H how can we choose the right patient? We have to take care about the pathology that we're choosing at the, uh, at the beginning if we are not uh, very experienced in local anesthetic procedures, which are the patient characteristics that Dr. Sinkari has just uh, mentioned some about and, and the patient preferences. So at the beginning, uh, if you are uh, new in this uh, kind of procedures, you have to choose something that it's in a location where you feel comfortable working with 
and uh, which it doesn't extend uh, further in the nose uh, in areas that that you might find some troubles or potential complications. So uh, at the beginning, please uh, try to choose something that um, the potential bleeding is uh, is low. If if you uh, if you choose cases with um, a lot of uh, edema and inflammation, uh, it's going to end up with a lot of bleeding. It's going to make you uncomfortable and the patient uncomfortable as well. So this is um, something that you want to avoid at the beginning. About the patient, um, uh, be careful about their morbidities. The, if the patient needs some blood thinners, anticoagulants, or if the patient uh, has been rejected uh, from uh, general anesthesia and you're trying to say, okay, I'm gonna do local, be careful because if something happened and you have to intubate this patient in a rush, uh, you, you, you might find yourself in a situation, in a very uncomfortable situation. So uh, choose carefully there. And the level of anxiety, as uh, Carrie said before, just um, see how the patient reacts when uh, when you are doing a nasal endoscopy in the in the office. It's a bouncy patient and it's shouting. Just um, try try not to start there. You want you want something calm, something that following instructions. Some someone uh, who who will answer when you when you ask. And, and also the, the na nasal anatomy, it's important at the beginning because if you have a very narrow uh, um, nasal fossa with a very twisted um, uh, septum, it's, uh, you're gonna um, have uh, some um, hard time doing any kind of procedures. Obviously, patient preferences is very important. Um, they are gonna ask which, um, which way is better but you, you always have to tell the patient um, um, the, the truth about the, the procedure, if you are gonna uh, achieve the same or not, and then they can, uh, they, they can decide. Many of, uh, it, it depends a, li a lot on where, where, uh, where you based, because um, for example, my, my personal experience, uh, uh, many patients will try to avoid the uh, general general anesthesia. So uh, this is uh, a procedure that uh, that they will uh, be keen on having. The staff also, or your team is very important. Um, uh, nurses, um, it's um, it, it's a, a high important. Part. I'm hearing some uh, sound in the background. Okay, so uh, nurses, uh, it's very important. Uh, if you have to, to train a new nurse every time you're doing a, a, the procedure, uh, you're gonna, uh, everything's gonna be slowed down. So if you're lucky to have the same, uh, uh, and, uh, the same nurse uh, over and over and, and you can train uh, new ones, uh, this will uh, speed things up. Also their availability and their motivation, uh, in my personal experience, they um, the the nurses uh, really enjoy these these procedures. At, at the beginning, they are more nervous as we are, and then uh, they get uh, very comfortable. This is uh, Josefina. She started with us uh, in, in 2018 doing this kind of procedures, and she's now retired. But she trained a lot of nurses that are still working with us. She had everything prepared. You can see all uh, she prepared all the. Um, all the things that we need in the um, in the office to bring from the OR to prepare uh, for um, um, local anesthetic procedures. So we do it in the office. I will show you later. And about the surgeons, also the it's very important the preference. What the surgeon is, uh, which are their preference, and this is uh, going to be influenced uh, in these uh, two things. Have you been uh, in your training, for example, if you've been trained uh, by someone who has done or who is doing uh, local anesthetic procedures, you will feel it natural. That it was what happened to me. I, I did my, my fellowship in, in Canada and, and there I, I learned to do these procedures. So when I came back to Spain, I just I keep doing it. So for me, it wasn't uh, a big deal, but if you've never seen anyone doing that, then you might have uh, feel uh, less comfortable. So uh, if, you're, if you're starting, please, uh, uh, be comfortable first in the with general you know, anesthesia, and then you switch to local anesthetic procedure, not the other way around. And if you don't feel comfortable, just ask us. And there, we are doing a lot of courses in this, and you can visit. and And then you will easily build up the that the that experience that is going to affect your level uh, of comfort. And when you're comfortable, your preferences are going to change, and you're going to see uh, a lot of opportunities in in, in these local anesthetic procedures. 
Another important thing, which are the surgeons concerned uh, when we uh, started um, not doing, but, but sharing uh, our experience, most of our colleagues were, were worried about two main things. Um, is this safe? Uh, what, uh, is, the, those, is this procedure safe or what you're doing? And is the, are you torturing the patient or the patient is uh, having a, a comfortable time? So uh, I tried to look in the literature and as uh, uh, Dr. Carey explained before, there wasn't much and spe specifically in tolerance of the patient in um, local anesthetic procedures, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, endoscopic uh, in, in the nasal polypectomy, we didn't find much. So um, we start to collect all the, uh, uh, all the data from the, our first 50 patients and we published the, this data. Um, one part of this work uh, was uh, trying to answer this uh, question. Was the procedure safe and how was the, the patient's comfort? So at the end of the procedure, we will ask them about pain and give them visual analogic scale. Um, it was uh, very low. Uh, the mean uh, was uh, 2.6 out of 10. And usually uh, below four, it means this is uh, a well tolerated procedure. Um, a basic patient don't feel pain. They say that it's like a sting, a bite, uh, mostly because uh, this is uh, in polypectomy, so in areas that weren't correctly anesthetized. Also, we met, uh, we measure uh, all the vitals and in blood pressure. This is uh, before the procedure, during and after. You can see how the patient and the, the blood pressure was, uh, will go down and they will relax because at the beginning they were very nervous. They didn't know where they were, what they were facing. But once you start and, and everything is running smoothly, the patient will just calm down. And about the safety, it's very important to monitorize the patient and have an IV uh, control in case you need some IV medication, which uh, it's rare, but um, complications in general are mild. Uh, uh, I think the most common will have the presyncope. Pres you, you have to, as uh, Sim was saying before, you have to talk to the patient to look at the patient. If the patient start and, uh, not answering your, quest your questions, get pale, just put it, uh, put it down, do this, turn the uh, maneuver and you will, and then you can proceed and, and finish the procedure. Uh, you may have some epistaxis, discomfort, you can um, deal with that easily. And um, there's only one severe complication that, that we had, that it was a complete symptom that um, uh, we uh, blame the trigeminal uh, cardiac reflex. This uh, is a very powerful reflex that uh, can uh, happen. There's not much published in, in rhinology. There are many publications in maxillofacial surgery, but um, um, any kind of manipulation of the nose can uh, trigger this reflex and it's very powerful. So um, in this patient, for example, um, has a severe bradycardia end up in the ICU. It was discharged in the, the next day with uh, no sequel, sequels. But um, it is something that make you think that um, uh, any any kind of pr procedures that you're doing uh, inside the nose should be in a safe environment. That's uh, uh, you have to be prepared for for uh, eventual complications, and for that uh, it's very important the location uh, um, or where you are doing these uh, procedures. This is the the next uh, part. So where are you are you going to do? Uh, there's uh, several models that we have um, described. Um, the in-office model that is the one that I use, a procedure room model, model and uh, just a regular operating theater. Um, and this is um, also pre-pandemic. This is how we do it. We're still doing the same, but now with a uh, mask. <laughs> and basically you have the patient there, we're removing polyps, with electric microbrider, the patient is awake. We have our senior nurse training another nurse there. And for us, uh, the advantage is that uh, we have uh, this room always available. And the disadvantage might be the logistic. You have to uh, bring some stuff from the, from the OR. Uh, I work also with my other rhinology colleagues. We have done many cases now since 2018. Other model is the procedure room, better equipped, but not every hospital have it or some people do it uh, in the operating room. 
uh, like uh, my colleague Jaime Santos in Valladolid, uh, he, it, it's a it's a great um, a great way to do it because you have everything in there. It's the safest environment, but you are blocking an OR. So uh, be careful, and if you're gonna do it, try to do it in a in an area where you have an ICU available. This is, for example, my clinic uh, private. I don't do it uh, there because I don't have an ICU. So I do it in my hospital in uh, Marques de Valdecilla. Another thing that you want to uh, take care, uh, as I said before, check your regulations. I was recently in Turkey and they told me that uh, it, it was forbidden to do um, uh, local anesthetic procedures. So check about that. And remuneration or reimbursement, I think is one of the most, the biggest uh, limitations that people are are finding in, in other uh, countries. Uh, for example, in, in us, it's not a, a big deal. We are uh, we work in a public system, we are on salary. So it doesn't matter if you do uh, one way or, or another, at the end, you're gonna make the same. But uh, some people that work in procedure-based uh, um, re re uh, reimbursement, you have to check if, what the codification of, of these procedures are going to be. And if they're gonna pay you the same or more or less, because uh, um, uh, I have talked with many uh, doctors in Portugal, for example, and and they they will get uh, way lower reimbursement uh, doing it lo with local anesthetic. So people uh, will find this a uh, huge limitation. That's why it's uh, in red. And about the surgery itself, um, the anesthesia you have to choose what you we do it only with local submucosa. Uh, uh, in the UK, I know that a lot of people use ner nerve blocking. Check this uh, nice review by Dr. Ahmed. He has a lot of experience in these procedures too. And local sedation, uh, some people use it. I think we're going to see next uh, some uh, explanation uh, on that. Um, this is how we do it. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Mejia, our senior rhinologist uh, during the pandemic time. Um, just uh, in a patient, what you see is a little bit uh, bouncy, shaky. It's not the best patient to start with, but um, he's a very experienced surgeon. He's now just placing some submucosa um, um, anesthesia. And in the complete video, you can see how all those polyps are removed. And the patient at the end is just telling us their experience that was very pleasant. So also the level of difficulty is going to a chain depending on your learning curve and so uh, what you have to gain first experience with a general anesthesia and then you're gonna uh, the more precise you are the less pain you're gonna have so in order to be safer i've worked with these uh, uh, colleagues uh, very experienced surgeons in spain uh, working in a, in a protocol similar to the one that dr Carri show uh, for the UK, this one is for Spain. Trying to um, see uh, to show other colleagues that what we're doing is, is safe and uh, to follow the um, recommendations if they want. For me, the biggest benefit, uh, I, I wouldn't say is cost reduction because it doesn't affect me um, directly, but it is uh, the, the early access to treatment. For example, in, in this case, this is a patient that had previously uh, surgery somewhere else, then I did a polypectomy and he had just a uh, regrowth in blocking the sphenoid sinus. Uh, I didn't work the medical therapy. So I just did another uh, polypectomy in the office and, and a sphenoidotomy. I look one month after how clean it is. Um, this will take me like eight months of waiting list in the, in the, in the public system that I work with. So uh, the potentials uh, I is one, one sentence because um, I always say that in the right patient, if you choose correctly, you can do as much as you want or as much as you can. So your surgical goals should be balanced between the complications and the safety and comfort of, uh, of the patient. So use the common sense. Uh, if you have some little polyps in the sphenoid uh, recess that it's not going to block the airway. So try to... Try to leave it. Don't go there if if you the patient is gonna be more comfortable or you can have some bleeding. So, um, training and experience is gonna teach you all that, and then you can do absolutely whatever you want. Um, uh, there are some people out there doing complete fest. Um, I I do mostly polypectomies, but I've done several other procedures. So to sum up, to sum up, it basically. 
uh, to overcome all all of uh, we have to overcome all, all these uh, difficulties and limitations in order to to unleash the real potential uh, of this uh, uh, philosophy because it's a philosophy and and when you have uh, overcome these difficulties you you will really uh, enjoy uh, and and learn from this so um thank you very much i think that's uh, all i wanted to share You are, uh, we cannot hear you, Marlene. You're mute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your great presentation. You're um, I would like to remind everyone, it would be wonderful if you could type your questions into the chat, into the questions and answers. We already have some questions and we will answer them at the end of the talk. So now we'll head over and our next panelist is Jonathan Joseph. And he will now talk about polypectomy in the office. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, and to uh, present um, uh, a little bit about uh, my experience of um, polypectomy in the office. Um, so just checking, can you all, is the screen sharing okay? Yes. Yep, good, okay, um, good. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna focus, uh, so I, I work in London uh, at the Royal National Inners and Throat Hospital. Um, and um, I'm very fortunate that we have a, a, a very, very well set up procedure area. Um, and, uh, and that's where I carry out um, all of my procedures. So um, I'm gonna focus on how I do polypectomy um, and uh, how I set up my um, theater. Um, and then once I've talked about that, I'm gonna do a little bit about um, uh, sedation. So operator delivered sedation um, without uh, the involvement of uh, an anesthetist, which is uh, how we've uh, proceeded in our unit. So, um, the first thing that I always uh, want to give a patient um, um, at the start of the procedure is um, what we call cofenolcaine. So uh, phenylephrine and lignocaine spray into the nose. So um, I should say prior to this, um, uh, I would, uh, in a similar setup to how um, Sean was showing us, there's a, uh, an, an admitting area where um, I, I go through the procedure with the patient. Um, and the, one of the keys to this, to, to good awake surgery, is talking the patient through the, every, every little bit of the procedure. You, you tell them what's going to happen. You talk them through each, each step of the way. Uh, and that's the, that's, that's the best way to ensure that they're going to be as relaxed as possible. Um, so I tell them that they'll go into the next room. Um, I will spray the nose um, with uh, cofenolcaine and then start to uh, do some uh, infiltration and then the actual procedure. Um, the, I only use a very small amount of, of this cofenolcaine spray because uh, anyone that's used it, uh, certainly in an outpatient setting, will know that it, it can um, drip down into the throat and cause throat discomfort. Um, and the patients seem to find that quite unpleasant, uh, particularly during a, a procedure when they're already feeling a bit anxious. Um, so just one spray on each side. Uh, the alternative is to soak some cotton wool or pledgets uh, in the same solution and just place it in the nose. Um, the alternatives that I know uh, Dr. Carey uses is um, Moffitt solution um, uh, and, and others use Oatrine. So there are various options, but this is, this is what I have chosen and I find uh, works for me. Um, and so this is just a view of this, uh, the way we set up the operating theatre. Um, so it, it's a it's a mini operating theatre, so smaller than the average, but uh, um, uh, it's, it's got everything that you need. Um, so there are normally probably uh, two nurses um, in the room. So one is uh, directly assisting me, uh, and then the other one is sort of the runner, so can can fetch things as required. Um, as you can see, the patient has a, a damp uh, swab, uh, a damp, damp piece of gauze over their eyes. Uh, and this uh, does help to relax them, um, and, and most patients prefer that. I tell them, try to imagine you're in a very fancy health spa, 
Um, I'm not sure they always believe me, um, but uh, but it it, uh, it does help. Uh, but of course, they can't see anything, so you, you they've really got to talk them through the whole thing. Um, and this is me in the middle of a, a polypectomy. So so once we're sort of set up and we're in position, and, and you also note that the patient's lying flat. I know that uh, I almost showed them uh, sitting up. I find that this method, uh, similar to how I would have them in a normal operating theatre, um, is, uh, is the most uh, suited to me, so I can try to recreate uh, how I do it in a normal uh, general anaesthetic setting. Um, uh, so once I've um, put the uh, cofenarcaine spray in, the first thing I want to do is decongest the nose. Now I tend to use uh, adrenaline-soaked um, neuropathies, uh, we use one in 10,000 adrenaline. Uh, it's certainly uh, an option to soak them in a local anaesthetic as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and that can be very helpful, particularly uh, deeper in the nose and particularly in the sphenopalatine area, either using uh, lidocaine or bupivacaine. Um, and, uh, and that can be very effective. And it's important to wait. Um, anyone that's done polypectomy, uh, certainly in a general anaesthetic setting in theatre, will know you leave the uh, adrenaline soaked gauze in the nose uh, for a few minutes, and the decongestion uh, is really uh, very marked uh, and allows the procedure to progress much more easily. Uh, and, and certainly in, a, in an awake setting, you want to uh, promote vasoconstriction uh, and uh, reduce the chance of bleeding. Uh, as a side note, um, uh, there, is, uh, there are studies out there um, that show bleeding in the awake patient in having polypectomy is lower than uh, in an anaesthetized patient, which, which would be counterintuitive. An anaesthetized patient would have usually a low blood pressure, low heart rate, uh, and is of course very relaxed. Um, but um, it, it, to do with the uh, vascular tone, uh, in the awake patients, they do tend to bleed less, because uh, that I know is a concern for many. So just a, a very brief slide on um, the uh, innovation of the nose. So um, looking at the picture uh, on the uh, left as you're looking at it, so in blue, there's the nasociliary nerve, um, and, uh, and then in, in green, um, there's the nasopalatine or sphenopalatine nerve. So, um, and then looking at the picture on the right, it shows a little bit more detail about those nerves. Um, uh, so um, the, I know, unfortunately, I can't point, but the, the nasal ciliary nerve, you can see it's marked just as it's coming off the uh, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. So that you've got the trigeminal ganglion uh, just on the left side of the picture. Uh, and then um, the nasal ciliary nerve coming uh, uh, in, into the eye as part of the ophthalmic nerve. It then branches into the posterior and anterior ethmoid nerves, and then further forward, there's the infratrochlear uh, nerve. So these are the areas that I'm focusing on to uh, anesthetize, to, to provide regional anesthesia, um, to um, give the best block to the ethmoid uh, sinuses, uh, part of the septum, uh, and, uh, and it can be quite effective. And also the lateral nasal wall, particularly from the sphenopalatine nerve. Um, so this is now me infiltrating the um, nasal ciliary nerve. So it's, it's described as, as um, trying to find a point about a centimeter above the medial canthus, uh, in between the palpable fissure, the posterior palpable fissure and the eyebrow. Um, and uh, you're angling the needle down uh, towards the roof of the orbit. Um, approximately, you're going about two centimeters uh, deep into the, uh, along the wall of the orbit, and, uh, and then you infiltrate uh, and withdraw uh, whilst you're infiltrating. And this should uh, anesthetize that whole mesociliary uh, anterior, posterior ethmoid branch um, uh, complex. Uh, and, uh, and this can be quite effective um, to ensure that uh, the infratrochlear nerve is, uh, is also anesthetized, which helps more the sort of outer structure of the nose then um, repositioning the needle and going more to, more medially or more up towards the eyebrow region, um, that, that can be uh, effective. So, um, so that's the first thing I do. And you can see that the pledgets are inside the nose doing their job whilst we uh, infiltrate the outside. Um, <clears throat> the pseudopalatine ganglion block, there's different ways of doing it. 
Um, there's topical application, so placing the, the, the patty uh, soaked in local anesthetic in the sinopalatine area, uh, direct injection, and I've written the RAN needle. So this is a needle, it's called the reinforced anesthesia needle, and there's a picture of it there. Um, it's got a slight angle to it, um, and it's also got a, a hard stop uh, on the bevel tip. So it uh, only allows you to uh, push the needle into the mucosa so you don't go too deep. And I found that really useful and that it's rigid, not like a spinal needle, so it's not flopping around. And so, this, so for the sphenopalatine area, it's really very helpful to get uh, uh, the anesthetic in. Um, the alternative way is through the mouth using the greater palatine foramen. This is technically more difficult and can be a little uncomfortable. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's classically described as uh, just um, uh, in the uh, lateral part of the, of the, of the gingiva, um, adjacent to the upper third molar. Um, but I, I don't do that very often. Um, so um, uh, by this stage, you've got some good regional anesthesia. I will also infiltrate various points in the nose itself, um, particularly along the septum uh, and the inferior and middle turbinates. Um, infiltrating the axilla of the middle turbinate uh, is, uh, is very important because I'll often medialize it uh, and numbing that area can be very helpful. Um, the pictures show me holding the endoscope and the, and the microdebrider, uh, and then uh, patients do tolerate it very well, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's very effective. This was just a typical patient that I did uh, a couple of months ago. So uh, he had nasal polyposis, he also had a septal deviation, um, and I'll just show you some more pictures. Um, and, uh, and this is a really good case for polypectomy. He was also slightly elderly. I didn't particularly want an anesthetic, a general anesthetic. Um, so uh, he had a, a, a polypectomy and uh, an endoscopic uh, septoplasty uh, to, to correct that deviation that you can see. Um, and, uh, and the procedure went very nicely. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk very briefly about sedation. Uh, I've written there no fear because um, certainly many of my uh, ENT colleagues that I'm, I've come across are very nervous about doing it. It's not something that we're trained to do in, uh, in our standard ENT training um, and, uh, and there's a lack of uh, knowledge. Um, uh, so I've listed all the different specialties that I know of um, that uh, use sedation regularly often by themselves without the need for an anesthetist. So um, there's lots of models that uh, you can use to guide you. I spoke to the oral surgeons that I work very close physically uh, to, um, uh, and th they have huge amounts of experience. Um, and, and so there's lots of benefits, uh, reduced anxiety, um, there's no need for a pre-assessment, um, and uh, comparing it to having a full general anesthetic, far uh, shorter hospital stay, and as I said earlier, less bleeding in the awake setting, even if they are sedated. Um, and if there are safety concerns about having a full general, then sometimes sedation can be um, a safer um, option. Certainly in the UK, we have a huge shortage of anesthetists. Um, and so anything that we can do that uh, frees them up to be in, in other places in the, in the main operating theatre uh, is, is very advantageous. Um, so to get accreditation, um, there are, um, certainly in the UK, there's the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, um, safe sedation uh, guidelines, and the Royal College of Surgeons of England have, have produced uh, a standards document um, for safe conscious sedation. Um, and this has been uh, contributed to um, a lot by the, uh, the dental surgeons, the oral surgeons, because they have so much experience. Um, we've also got a standard operating procedure in our department, uh, and we have regular appraisals uh, and talk about any safety concerns or incidents and, and learning points. Um, so I only ever do um, ASA one or two or two patients um, because we are certainly in a relatively isolated area in our procedure zone. It's a separate building from the main hospital. There's no ITU on in that building that have to be transferred and there's no anesthetist around. So we don't want to get in trouble. And as Jaime was saying earlier, you, you don't want to put yourself in a difficult situation. You need to be confident that everything's there that you need. Um, so you need a trained sedationist, um, which, is, which is the operating surgeon and a sedation trained nurse. Uh, and that allows good monitoring and, and you do need um, regular um, blood pressure monitoring every 50 minutes and constant pulse and uh, pulse oximetry. 
Um, some use uh, CO2 monitoring, um, and that does give a higher level uh, monitoring, or particularly of, of ventilation. Uh, you've also got to have a rescue pack. Uh, so flumazolin is the main constituent, uh, which is the reversal agent uh, if you've given too much sedation. Uh, and uh, there must be oxygen available, and the patient also needs to have an escort. If they've forgotten to bring somebody with them, um, then you can't give them sedation because then they can't leave uh, because it's not safe to let them go on their own. Uh, I use midazolam. Um, you don't have to remember all of this. Um, the, key, the key message here is you titrate it slowly to the, to the need of the patient. You don't just give a big slug of midazolam um, think, yeah, five, 10 milligrams will be fine because then you, you, you might have gone too far. So you do it very gradually, waiting to see the effect. Uh, and then you, you wait for the sedation endpoint. Um, uh, and for the over 65, you have to be even more gradual in your administration of the, uh, the midazolam. Uh, and the, what is the sedation endpoint? Um, it's where you've achieved muscle relaxation, relief of anxiety. The patient's a little bit slurred, sleepy, slow to respond, uh, but they will, they will respond. Uh, and that's so important because they are still conscious, they will allow you to proceed. Um, and your overall clinical impression of when this point is reached is most important, which of course comes with experience. Um, and then you can uh, uh, start your procedure. Um, so midazolam, as I mentioned, is what I use. Um, the seven milligrams is, is, a, is a guide for how much is often required, but of course, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and uh, it only lasts about 30 minutes in terms of its maximal effect. After that, it starts to, to wane. Now, hopefully by that point, the patient's well uh, and um, topically uh, anesthetized so that uh, there's, there's minimal pain and they're not gonna suddenly start uh, getting worried again. Um, you can't really top it up because it's less effective. So you've got that 30 to 40 minute timeline uh, and, then, and then that's it from a sedation point of view. Um, I mentioned at the bottom fentanyl. Um, this is a very powerful uh, analgesic, uh, but it also causes respiratory depression, as does midazolam. So um, I myself haven't used it yet, um, and you have to proceed with great caution with that. Um, so that concludes um, my talk on polypectomy and sedation. Um, uh, this is the picture at the bottom right is our new Royal National uh, Ear, Nose and Throat Hospital opened by the Queen. Uh, who's now sadly passed away. Uh, and the top left is, is where we left um, some years ago, the old building. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, you, Jonathan, for the fantastic presentation, all to all the panelists for great presentations. We have got now Q&A session. So we have got interesting questions from all around the world, really. Um, starting with Luciano Gregorio from Brazil. And he would like to know whether you routinely perform nerve blockage when you perform nasal polypectomy. Uh, I think some of you touched this topic already. Uh, do you do it routinely or not? I don't. Um, no, no, not, not routinely for nasal polypectomy, just surface anesthesia. Surface yeah. anesthesia. Mm -hmm. The same. same. Yeah. And Jonathan? So I, I probably do more regional anesthesia, um, uh, but I'm, I'm still exploring the, the youthfulness of it. Um, uh, so I, I do find it effective. And if I think I'm going to do uh, an anterior ethmoidectomy along with my polypectomy, um, where I am going to break down some of the little cells, then, uh, then I think it, it's effective. Um, so so I, I tend to do, I do tend to use it, yes. Personally, I used to do greater part-time block trans, trans orally. But I faded away from that because, as you're saying, it's it is effective, but it's quite complicated and 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 fussy. So I, I think the also surface one is is pretty good. Uh, question from me, Emla, have you tried it or are you using Emla cream for the local anesthesia so it now doesn't numb the throat? No, I haven't. There's some good uh, papers on that, and we also use that. But obviously, this is very individual individual indication. I would uh, focus on, so we can continue with another question. Surgeries in local anesthesia, non-sterile conditions, sterile conditions. I think the question is outpatient clinic versus theater. Is 
do you pay any special attention towards the ster sterility of the conditions? Apart from standard uh, non sterile instruments, obviously. Um, so I, I have looked into this more generally also because um, especially now with, with a, an eye on sustainability and the carbon footprint uh, and the, the huge extra costs financially and uh, e ecologically from um, single use and, and sterile equipment. Um, because as we all know, the nose itself is, is, is dirty uh, and you can't sterilize it. Um, so um, I, personally, I, um, I, I operated an operating theater, so to speak, in the procedure theater. Um, but try to so to, to minimize um, the use of, of excessive sterile procedure um, additions. So I, I will use sterile gloves. Sometimes use a gown if I think that I'm going to be at risk of, of any uh, spatter. Um, I do always cover my endoscope and the scope head with a, a sterile sheet because I've been told by our uh, microbiologists that it's. There, there, there can be spatter and uh, it's very hard to, to sterilize the endoscope. So, um, so I'd say I, I sort of try to moderate how sterile I keep things, if that's a helpful answer. Very helpful. Jaime, Sean? Um, for us, uh, it's just exactly as uh, so I show you in, in the video. We do it in an in a office-based condition with not a special, uh, without paying special attention to uh, sterilization. And we haven't had trouble so far. As, as Jonathan has said, uh, it's a dirty environment. Uh, as long as you work uh, cleanly, I don't think you really need to be sterilized to do these kind of procedures. Yeah, I would just add that uh, in our uh, clinic room that we used to operate in, there are 12 changes of air per hour. So it's a, it's a properly ventilated um, a, a clinic room. And we don't use diathermy. So we know how, we don't have any plumes of, yeah. uh, of, of smoke or anything like that. Um, our instruments are, are sterile instruments. Uh, we have a very limited, I didn't show it, but we have a very limited tray of instruments. Um, uh, we don't gown up. The nurse doesn't, it's, as I showed my, my photograph, we, we, but we, we do have sort of eye and, 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 and face mask protection. But that's it. Thank you. Uh, another question is about uh, pre-medication. I think that's been actually excellently answered by by JJ, uh, also with dosages uh, of the medazolam and the other uh, pre-medication uh, uh, medication. I would just add that I, I, I don't give any, so it's been asked to me, would I give them five milligrams of, of diazolam mm -hmm. Valium? Um, or sort of before they arrive, but I don't do that because it's so sort of variable, the effectiveness. So IV is just, is much more um, accurate and, uh, and you can be much more reliable. Yeah, and also uh, it's probably also in most of cases not necessarily needed. Patients, yes. they cope quite well with the surface and uh, uh, local mm -hmm. anesthesia. I would like to note that, for example, I've used imidazolam only in a patient who was elderly and there was uh transformed ip and there was no other option and it was quite accessible so that was for example the case but otherwise i don't think it's very routinely used um another question is uh, is on uh, whether you use tamponade after inf interventions in uh, local anesthesia marco stoico is asking the question do you use any tamponade which which means any nasal packing i would say generally no i mean the, as uh, as both my Colleague speakers have alluded to the, the amount of bleeding is is generally less um, uh, because patients don't tolerate uh, bleeding under uh, local anesthesia procedures because if they're if they're lying at thirty degrees they're going to be they're going to be swallowing a lot of blood which is very uncomfortable and they won't carry on with the procedure so if you if you if you do get a, a significant amount of bleeding you generally stop the procedure anyway before the point where they they start to to uh, to get epistaxis. And once the procedure is finished, I think in one patient out of uh, 80 that we've um, done, that I can think of, uh, that we had to put a pack in. So we've only had one patient admitted over, uh, for, sorry, admitted for any length of time because of, uh, of bleeding. It's, it's not really an issue. Yeah. I guess yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So uh, I sometimes I'll give them a, a bolster underneath the nose to catch a few little drops, but, but almost yeah. never packing. 
<laughs> yeah, we, we don't usually pack noses, not even after FES in the OR. But in, in a patient that might have some uh, more bleeding during um, the, these uh, awake procedures, we just uh, put some patties with uh, oxymetazoline and, and make the patient wait for half an hour, then we remove it. And sometimes we even send the patient home with the patties and they just uh, take it out themselves in a couple of hours. So um, in all the plus 100 cases that, cases that we have done, uh, we have had to pack one or two like uh, uh, several hours before the procedure. So it's not a real uh, a big issue. Thank you. And probably the last question, a relevant one. When you use fentanyl, midazolam, would that be the indication to have anesthesiologists nearby or would you be administering that yourself with a nurse in the room? So the, the, the training that I had was all about doing it on your own. Um, uh, you, you, have, you modify your regime. So you give the fentanyl first, uh, to your dosage, um, and you and you wait for the uh, respiratory depressive effect of that. You then use the midazolam afterwards. So you've got a new, you've actually got a new baseline uh, and titrate slowly. So um, the, yes, of course, you've got to be very careful um, and don't put yourself at risk. But theoretically, uh, it should be possible um, done without the need for an anesthetist. Um, but yeah, just with a bit more caution. Thank you for a very detailed answer. And I think we're now reaching 8 p.m., so the end of the webinar. And I would like to thank, again, the panelists uh, for fantastic presentations and also Marlene for, um, uh, for guiding us through the webinar. And lastly, I would like to thank the Olympus for sponsoring this webinar and the whole webinar series. Without uh, Olympus help and sponsorship, it would be very difficult to put this together. And I would like to thank uh, participants for joining and I wish you a uh, nice the rest of the evening. Goodbye. Thanks, Pavel. Thank Bye. Very much. Have a good Bye. Night. Bye. Panelists uh, for fantastic presentations and also Marlene for um, uh, for guiding us through the webinar. And lastly, I would like to thank the Olympus for sponsoring this webinar and the whole webinar series. Without uh, Olympus help and sponsorship, it would be very difficult to put this together. And I would like to thank uh, participants for joining and I wish you a uh, nice rest of the evening. Goodbye. Thanks, Pavel. Yeah. Thank Bye. you very much. Have a good Bye. Night. Bye.